Ardem Patabotian, medicinpristagare 2021. Och här är vi nu, stora salongen i konserthuset i Stockholm. Sammanlagda antalet personer som ryms här är över 1700. Och här kommer början på Kungliga familjen in. På parketten sitter först och främst familjer till pristagarna och representanter från riksdag, regering och diplomatkår. Talmannen, Andreas Norlén. Och Marshall Fredrik Fressell. Och där är ju parketten, förlåt mig, podiet som har plats för ungefär 90 personer. Och de pristagarna i år är tio stycken. Och då har vi börjat. Pristagarna ska strax komma in till den vanliga Mozart-marschen. Han säger att de är tio stycken och var och en får ta med 14 gäster.
Och första talare är Nobelstiftelsens nya ordförande Astrid Söderberg Widing. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel Prize laureates, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Nobel Foundation, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Nobel Prize award ceremony. In particular, I wish to welcome the Nobel Prize laureates, their families and friends. Earlier today in Oslo, Narges Mohammadi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in her absence, and I quote, for her fight against the oppression of women in, in Iran and her fight to promote human rights and freedom for all, end of quote. Her absence was due to her being imprisoned together with many other prisoners of conscience in the notorious Evin prison in Tehran. In spite of these circumstances, her strong message smuggled out of prison and read by her children is finally one of hope. Victory is not easy, but it is certain. We look forward to receiving her family here in Stockholm in a few days. The message of Alfred Nobel transmitted to us through his will is equally clear. He believed in the unique powers of science, literature, and action for peace to help transform the world to the benefit of humankind. And for all of this, international collaboration and respect for knowledge are key. I'm convinced that this message is all the more important since it may seem untimely today, when the optimism of Nobel's time is being replaced by radical pessimism or even resignation, and when new interconnected crises challenge our understanding of our mission in academia, culture, and civil society. But on the contrary, I'm convinced that at this moment in history, with increasingly polarized views which tend to tear our societies apart, with democracies being undermined, and with wars and conflicts throughout the world which continue to cause so many victims, we need more than ever to keep Nobel's vision in mind. He believed in knowledge, enlightenment, and the pursuit of truth. The development of our world is not decided by destiny. It lies in our own power to decide on our future and on how to transmit our heritage to new generations. Our new capacities as humankind, both with digitization, which makes the world come closer than ever, and with artificial intelligence, which contains endless possibilities as well as risks, need to be addressed, both scientifically and culturally. Through free fundamental research, science explores and expands the frontiers of human knowledge, laying the foundations for applications and development work, and thus also providing preparedness for unexpected and unpredictable future events in our world. The scientific breakthroughs awarded this year, the Physics Prize for Experiments with Light, which capture the shortest of moments, the Chemistry Prize for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots, or the groundbreaking findings behind the prize in physiology or medicine that enabled the development of effective mRNA vaccines, and for the prize in economic sciences, research uncovering key drivers of gender differences in the labor market, all serve as powerful examples of the importance of forerunners who paved the way, as well as of the manifold phases of science. 
Together, we see their strength. Last, but certainly not least, the prize in literature explores through what I'm tempted to call fundamental research in literature, the boundaries of human existence by giving voice to the unsayable. The laureates being awarded tonight, each in a unique way, testify to the power of science and literature. They show us that individually and together, we have it within ourselves to change the world. Nu blir det musik med Kungliga Philharmonikerna under Alexander Hansson och det är musik av en ukrainsk tonsättare, Valentin Silvestrov.
Den är Valentin Silvestrov som gjort musiken i en äldre herre från Kiev. Han är bosatt i Berlin sedan den ryska invasionen förra året. Nu handlar det om fysikpriset. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel Prize laureates, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The world is big, so big, bigger than you ever can imagine. Those are the words of Zacharias Topelius, and they illustrate the fact that we are part of a vast universe, the universe that we are exploring. But the vast and the big is governed by the very small details. The small details that are beyond the capabilities of our five traditional senses of sight, smell, touch, taste and hearing. These small details have great impact on our lives and offer intriguing possibilities for expanding our knowledge. They give us the power to design materials and methods for exploration, for future sustainability and for promoting health. This applies to both length and time scale when we talk about the small details. This year's Nobel Prize in Physics is focused on small time scales and to be precise, the atom seconds. A heartbeat lasts for one thousand, 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 and thousand atom seconds. That is the same number of seconds since our universe was born. The outer second is the scale of the world of the electrons, a world that we now can explore. Back in 1925, Werner Heisenberg argued that this world cannot be seen. But thanks to outer second light pulses, this is starting to change. The challenge was an extremely short time scale. It took several decades to overcome this barrier. Atom second science allows us to address fundamental questions, such as the time scale of the photoelectric effect, for which Albert Einstein received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921. With attosecond pulses, we can study how the distribution of electrons oscillates within molecules and materials. The information about charge fluctuations holds secrets and solutions to how to control electronic migration. With attosecond chemistry, specific chemical bonds can be selectively broken or formed giving us a control to tailor new materials. With attosecond physics, we can study charge transfer processes in materials, and they are the key elements on, in the function and optimization of solar cells, batteries, catalysts, and electronics, as a few examples. The origin of this year's prize can be traced to the late 1970s and the early 1980s, when atoms in strong laser fields were studied. Our laureates discovered that it was possible to generate attosecond light pulses by controlling the interaction between lasers and atoms. They developed methods for measuring the duration of these pulses they also developed techniques for generating both pulse trains and individual pulses. Emeritus Professor Agostini, Professor Dr. Krauss, and Professor Anne Lollier. 
You have been awarded the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physics for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. It is an honor and a privilege to convey to you the warmest congratulations of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. I now ask you to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. Och först ut är Pierre Agostini. Han är den äldste av pristagarna i år. Ferenc Kraus från Ungern, född 1962. Och så Anne Louie som arbetar hos oss här i Lund. Men började i Frankrike där hon är född och uppvuxen. Populärt i salongen hör jag. När hon var ung så jobbade hon ihop med Agostini. De var på samma institut söder om Paris. På det här följer kemiprispresentationen direkt. Your Majesties. Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel Prize laureates, ladies and gentlemen. Materials can have strikingly different properties. For example, materials can be hard, soft or brittle. They can be transparent, reflective or colored. They can conduct electricity and heat or they can be good insulators. They can be magnetic or non-magnetic or melt at high or at low temperatures. When humans have discovered new materials, they have often fundamentally changed our society. Early examples are uh, bronze, iron and steel, the currently ongoing digital transformation and electrification are enabled by semiconductors and battery materials. Traditionally, to create a new material, we choose new chemical and structural compositions. That means we order atoms in new constellations. However, early in the 20th century, very soon after the development of quantum theory, a striking prediction was made. According to quantum mechanics, the properties of a material could be completely changed if it was made so small that it was only a few atoms across. In other words, it should be possible to modify a material's properties just by adjusting its size without changing its composition. For example, if particles were made small enough to squeeze together the electron's quantum wave, the electron should be able to store more energy and which they could then release to a bright photon, so that larger particles would emit red light, 
and smaller particles, blue light. Let me illustrate this. If you think of my fingernails as materials, you can see they have different sizes, but they look all the same. If they were at the nanoscale, then a large fingernail might look red, a smaller one might look blue, and with all colors in between. <laughs> For several decades, this remained a purely theoretical prediction. It seemed almost impossible to make particles consisting of a specific number of atoms with the required perfect crystallinity and pristine surfaces. Alexei Yakimov solved this challenge using glass-making methods. During the cooling process of molten glass, he managed to create copper chloride crystals whose color varied with size precisely as predicted by quantum mechanics. He had discovered that it was possible to make quantum dots. Louis Bruce paved the way to producing quantum dots that were free in solution using standard chemical methods. His discovery triggered a wave of interest in learning how to make these new nanostructures, these new nanomaterials, and in using them for exciting applications. At first, however, it was difficult to produce quantum dots of sufficiently high quality and in large enough quantities. Munji Bawendi developed an ingenious chemical method that produced very high quality quantum dots that was that could be modified to create more complex structures and was scalable to industrial production levels. The discoveries of this year's laureates have made decisive contributions to the interdisciplinary field of nanoscience. Nanotechnology is about making structures a thousand times smaller than, the strand, than a strand of hair and using them for better, safer and more powerful devices and technologies. Quantum dots, specifically, are used to explore the inner life of biological cells, to improve screens and the quality of energy-saving LED lighting, and to mark tumor tissue during surgery. There's also intensive research into using quantum dots for improved solar cells in flexible electronics or in future quantum communication. Munji Bawendi, Louis Bruce, and Alexei Yakimov your discovery of quantum dots and how to make them has opened up a new way of designing materials and helped catalyze the field of nanoscience. This is a truly great achievement for the benefit of humankind. On behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, I wish to convey you our warmest congratulations. May I now ask you to step forward and receive your Nobel Prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. Munji Bavendi har en tunisisk far och fransk mor. Och man kan faktiskt då notera att Agostini där längst ut på kanten är född i Tunis just. Då är det Louis Bruce. Och så Alexej Yekimov, född i Leningrad precis när andra världskriget tog slut. Dagens Sankt Petersburg alltså. En bosatt och arbetare i USA sedan länge.
Nu ska vi få musik av Berlioz. Fransk musik alltså. Och då ska vi få höra solisten Julia Sporsén också.
Julias Porsén och Kungliga Filharmonikerna ledda av Alexander Hansson. Då är det det tredje priset i Nobels testamente, medicin eller fysiologi. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel Prize laureates, gen uh, ladies and gentlemen. DNA is the genetic blueprint that defines what we are. A fish, a honeybee, a lemon tree, or a human. RNA is less well known, but equally important. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, carries genetic information and acts as a template for protein production. Thousands of different mRNA molecules are present in each of our cells at any given time, instruct instructing the cells how to develop and what functions to execute. Conversion of DNA to mRNA to protein is an evolutionary concerned process that is common to all forms of life. Messenger RNA was first defined by Jacob and Monod in 1961, a discovery that was awarded with the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1965. Although the identity and function of mRNA has been known for over 60 years, and mRNA is routinely used in most modern medical research laboratories, the term has remained largely obscure outside the scientific community until recently. This year's Nobel Prize laureates in physiology or medicine, Professor Katalin Kariko and Professor Drew Weissman, have ensured that the term mRNA is now broadly recognized. Most of us present here today have received one or several mRNA vaccine doses in our arm a process that directs some of our cells to produce the encoded protein for a short while. If the mRNA encodes a foreign virus protein, such as in the case of the COVID vaccines, this will alert our immune system to stimulate a response against the virus, protecting us against disease should we later become infected. RNA molecules are elegantly simple in their composition, with just four building blocks nucleotides linked together in different order to encode any protein of interest. Katalin Karikó, an expert mRNA biochemist, and Drew Weissman, a skilled immunologist, shared a vision of using mRNA as a generic carrier of information for clinical applications. But early results showed limited success. Caricot and Weissman realized that to achieve their goal, they needed to understand how our cells respond to different forms of RNA at the molecular level. In a breakthrough discovery published in 2005, they demonstrated that mRNA produced with standard nucleotides evoked an undesired inflammatory response in our cells. They found that this reaction was circumvented when one of the four nucleotides was chemically modified to mimic our own mRNA. This finding provided a solution to a major problem previously facing all mRNA-based clinical applications, propelling the mRNA technology into a whole new era. The discovery by this year's Nobel Prize laureates in physiology or medicine surprisingly enabled the development of effective vaccines that helped control a devastating pandemic and save millions of lives 15 years later. In 2020, the scientific community, together with governments, the private sector, and regulatory authorities, demonstrated that it's possible to greatly reduce the time needed for vaccine development in situations where this is urgently needed. Science communication is challenging. The silver lining of the pandemic was the opportunity to increase public's awareness and knowledge about infectious threats and how our immune system functions. Terms like mRNA, virus variants, antibodies, T cells and B cells are now uh, common to most, pe most people understand these terms. And 
surveys demonstrate that the public's trust in scientific research increased during the pandemic. The basic research performed by the 2023 laureates in uh, physiology or medicine no doubt contributed to this. This year's prize is very much in the spirit of Alfred Nobel, a groundbreaking contribution to the greatest benefit of humankind. Dear Professors Carrico and Weissman, on behalf of the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute, it's my great joy and privilege to convey to you our warmest congratulations. I invite you now to step forward to receive the Nobel Prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. Katalin Kariko är från Ungern, alltså jobbat så gott länge i USA. Så hon är landsman till fysikern Kraus, får man vill säga då, ursprungligen i alla fall. Och de båda pristagarna har jobbat ihop länge. De hade lite olika ingångar i problemet från början. Men deras forskning kunde användas i tillämpningen att finna ett vaccin mot covid-19. Och det här är ett mycket populärt pris som ni ser. Då är det musik igen, musik av Frans Lear, det vill säga från Ungern. Thank you. 
Det där är en riktig operett musik det. Oj, oj, oj. Julias Porsén. Och nu ska vi istället för operan och operetten tänka oss det norska västlandet. Höga berg och djupa fjordar. Det är dags för litteraturpriset. Eders majestäter, ärade pristagare, mina damer och herrar. Att träda in i Jon Fosses värld är att komma till en trakt av största oro och beslutsvånda. Hans rika författarskap kretsar kring den enskilda människans vilsenhet och svårigheter att finna en väg i livet. Vare sig han skriver prosa, dramatik eller lyrik- Närmar han sig ett osäkert tillstånd som kan öppna en förbindelse med det gudomliga. Här räcker inte de gängse orden till. Men det sällsamma med Fosse är att han lyckas som prismotiveringen lyder att ge röst åt det osägbara. Redan tidigt fångar Fosse det osägbara i det lilla prosastycket. Jag kunde inte säga det till dig. Vi möter en gammal man som inte kan bli kvitt det glimrande minnet av något han inte förmått säga till sin älskade genom alla år. Han kan inte glömma hennes blick när hon sitter ensam vid ett bord i skolmatsalen. Och minnet har obevekligt bitit sig fast i honom. Inte ens på hennes dödsbädd är det möjligt? Ord och liv har glidit isär. Men när Fosse ger den gamle röst åt det omöjliga förvandlas det till en berörande elegi och triumf över språklösheten. I det sena storverket Septologin som fullbordades 2021- i huvudpersonen Asle en åldrad målare som i bön vänder sig till en gud bortom alla begrepp på föreställningar i den kristne medeltidsmystiken Mäster Eckhards anda. Men både i det tidiga prosestycket som jag nämnde och i den sena romanen är huvudpersonen uppfylld av en oro 
som skapar en spänning mellan det vardagliga och det gudomliga. Det är denna oro som ger hela författarskapet en inre dramatik. Jon Fosse är ingen svår författare. Han använder de enklaste ord och skriver om erfarenheter som vi alla har en relation till. Separation, död och sårbar kärlek. Det svåra hos Fosse rör snarare vår beredskap att öppna oss för den existentiella osäkerhet som han ständigt rör vid. Men att han är en av samtidens mest spelade dramatiker vittnar om att också denna vonda kan delas av många. Det speciella med Fosses enkelhet är att den får djup och intensitet genom att upprepas och varieras. I Fosses tidiga gastkramande roman Stäng gitarr, där en mor låser sig ute och därmed skilts från sin lilla dotter, är det paniken som blivit ett med språkformen. I den skimrande berättelsen Morgon och kväll övergår oron i förundran och djup förtröstan där den gamle Johannes en morgon håller på att dö och hans verklighetssinne börjar svikta. I septologin blir den böljande prosan utan punkt ett med målaren Asles irrande tankar och suger in läsaren med hypnotisk kraft. Antingen kretsar Fosse runt det osägbara som är de här verken eller så väljer han tystnadens språk som i sin radikala förnyelse av världsdramatiken under 1990-talet. Med början i det internationella genombrottet någon kommer att komma upptäcker han möjligheten att låta språklösheten ta kropp på scenen. På teatern måste allt inre komma ut och det som inte kan sägas måste också få en röst. Och det sker i en lång rad emotionellt laddade pjäser som namnet, dröm om hösten eller dödsvariationer. Där vidgas också tiden där de döda tar plats i scenrummet. Jon Fosse är den första Nobelpristagaren i litteratur som skriver på nynorska. Och precis som sin stora norske föregångare Tarje Vesås förhenar han en stark lokal anknytning med en tro på samtidslitteraturens möjligheter. Han skyr den slutgiltiga formuleringen, vilket gör det nästan omöjligt att citera honom. Han är på så sätt ambivalensens och det oavgjordas mästare. I hans värld vibrerar osäkerheten av ett hemligt ljus. Kära Jon Fosse, tillåt mig att framföra den svenska akademins varma gratulationer och be stiga fram och motta Nobelpriset i litteratur ur hans majestät Korningens hand. Jon Fosse från Haugesund i Västra Norge. Och då är det norsk musik av Edvard Grieg eh, ur två av Griegs verk faktiskt. Per Gynt och Jorsho Lafar. Thank you. 
Andra halvan här var en hyllningsmarsch till kung Sigurd av Norge. Han fort till Jerusalem som hette Jorsala för de gamla nordborna på tidig medeltid. Så Jorsala far. Då är det ekonomipriset till Alfred Nobels minne som ska presenteras. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, esteemed Nobel Prize laureates, ladies and gentlemen. It is about time. This year's prize in economic sciences is essentially about time. Time should have the potential to be a great equalizer. Everybody gets the same daily allowance and gets to choose how to spend it. But although the length of the day is equally distributed, its span is often not enough uh, for, for the pursuit of life's many goals. Because raising children takes time. Engaging in a long educational program takes time. Investing in a career, climbing the promotional ladder takes time. Claudia Golden explains that women had to make choices about time under different constraints than men. These choices had economic underpinnings and were appropriate given the circumstances of the time and the ability of women to peer accurately into the future. The result, however, has been unequal outcomes in how much time women spend working in the labor force, in how much they earn when they work. It is about time because living conditions change over time. Golding shows how a host of technological advances in the home, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, and washing machines freed up women's time during the past century. She explains how the emergence of birth bill controls in the 1960s improved women's ability to plan career and family. As a result, the rate of women entering the labor market tripled in many countries undeniably one of the largest economic and social changes of modern times. But can we expect that the mere passage of time will do the trick? Claudia Golden tells us that historically this has not been the case. She digs deeply into the archives and reveals the various type of work carried out by female professionals who were not listed with occupations in historical censuses. But they were butchers, bakers, seamstresses, shoemakers, pewterers, Coopers, pewters, tin plate workers, glass engravers, and ironmongers, just to mention a few. Despite being absent from official records, these women carried out their work. With industrialization, these professions became rarer among women, and during 200 years of American history, female labor market participation decreased before it increased. Time served as a divider before it became an equalizer. It is about time, because change takes time. Golden's work teaches us that history progresses slowly as each generation achieves its own form of success, then passes the baton to the next. On a wintry day in Chicago in 1971, a baton was surely passed. A young woman dressed in high boots and a fashionably short coat that barely covered her miniskirt observed a gray-haired woman, a retired professor, walk into the computer center carrying a large box of punch cards. The two women were separated by more than their age and by more than their fashion sense, but they occupied the same moment in time. What the young woman learned from the older one was that women could have the same commitment to research as male professors. She saw a vision of the possible and felt the desire to achieve what was lacking. In her book, Career and Family, Golden recalls this moment as an apparition, a reminder of the past and a vision of the future at the same time. Today, a winter day in Stockholm will forever be another historical moment. Professor Claudia Golden, it is about time that the world learns the long work history of half its population. Your research has radically changed what we know about women in the labor market and how we understand what we know. Today, we celebrate your path-breaking academic achievements. They are more than a baton to be passed. They are giant shoulders from which coming generations will be able to see very far. It is an honor and a privilege to convey to you, on behalf of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, 
our warmest congratulations. May I now please ask you to step forward and receive your prize from the Majesty, the King. En kvinna som mottagare av ekonomipriset till Alfred Nobels minne, det har vi ju aldrig sett förr. Så det här är mycket speciellt. Ekonomipriset var inte med från början, kom på slutet på 60-talet. Och hon är den tredje kvinnan bara som får det. Och nu är det lång extra lång applåd igen. Och där är ju ceremonin slut med Alvens drottningens Saba. Men vi har tid kvar, så sitt kvar. Jag ska ge mig upp på podiet och mingla lite och prata med en pristagare till exempel. Och medan jag tar mig dit ska vi presentera Nobelstiftelsens nya ordförande Astrid Söderberg Widding. Hon är också fortfarande rektor för Stockholms universitet något år till. Jag undrade bland annat vad hon har för planer för sitt nya jobb på Nobelstiftelsen.